Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to our Tuesday Speaker Series. As you know, we try to give a breadth of um, opportunity to, to all of us to hear from different types of speakers. And over the course of the semester, we've heard some from litigators, um, some law firm partners, some uh, legal innovators. And now we're going to hear a little bit. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit about the general counsel point of view. Um, as many of you have heard, this is the era of more for less where general counsels are demanding more and more. Um, they're demanding unbundled services that are disaggregated and, um, and that cost less. They're demanding their lawyers to innovate and change the way that they provide services um, and that the way that they communicate. Um, general counsels are really leading uh, some of the disruption and change that we've been seeing in the legal marketplace. And there's no one better than Rick Solomon to talk to us about those changes because he's been working with general counsels and pushing them uh, for the last 20 years uh, with his company, Vantage Point Consultants. He has actually consulted with 400 of the 500 Fortune 500. So uh, that's a lot of time and a lot of consulting and a lot of learning. I don't know how he's going to fit it into 35 minutes, but he did promise to leave lots of time for Q&A. Um, Rick brings a ton of experience even before that as a lawyer and partner at Mayor Brown. And he also is very involved with the community, serving on many different boards and some nonprofits, including one of his proudest achievements of recent note is the Illinois Holocaust Museum, um, which I think is, uh, he said, is one of the second largest now in the country. So we really welcome Rick. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, let me make a few introductory comments as to how I sort of got into this and then start, start the PowerPoint. Um, as Michelle said, I was an associate, a partner, and a litigator at Mayor Brown, but I also I always thought you could design a better way to deliver legal services. And I was taken by a comment among many from my old law professor who now taught my son recently at NYU, Arthur Miller, who among his many memorable comments was, discovery is like the dance marathons of the 30s. The object is to move as slowly as possible to the music without coming to a halt. And it always struck me that there were better ways to design how legal services are provided. So I be, you know, had an entrepreneurial uh, interest, and uh, this created an opportunity. And I have, as Michelle said, worked with lots of companies and had that privilege. And I probably interface with about 60 general counsel a week. First, you know, let me say, what do I do? I'll give you my elevator speech. Any successful lawyer or business person has to have that. And it has a Harvard connection. Um, I was with a uh, roommate. Uh, this goes back about 25 years. Uh, and uh, he introduced me from Harvard, he, uh, both law school and business school, he introduced me to Sandy Weil, then of Travelers, later Citigroup and City. And he said, you have two floors, Sandy. He said, to tell, you, tell me what you do. Well, I spent one floor thinking about it. Fortunately, the elevators, if you've been to 388 Greenwich Street, are rather s slow. Uh, and I said, manage legal care. It's applying concepts from healthcare and manufacturing to legal services. We're not dealing with widgets, but you need to increasingly put the corporate legal function under the microscope, too. And that is what you know, I I've gotten involved in doing with our people. Second comment, just to show how the world turns and changes. Uh, 15, 17 years ago, I went to Coca-Cola, a company that I had the privilege of working with later. And, and said, you know, you, you may want to do some things to optimize the corporate legal dollar. And uh, the person who can remain nameless said, costs really don't matter here. Well, few people say that today. Another introductory comment before getting into the PowerPoint, and that is probably it was best stated uh, in terms of the fossilized industry that lawyers can find themselves in. That's not to say that you need to be a fossil, but I think there is a tendency, as uh, you, know, you hear through other programs, I'm sure, with the Center for the Legal Profession, uh, about how lawyers can be dinosaurs and they simply don't want to have any kind of change or accept new ways of doing things. I think 
uh, along with the work of Michelle, you need to crack some eggs to make an omelet. Um, I think it was best said, I was on a program with an executive from Hughes Aircraft, a non-lawyer I might add, who said to a group of lawyers the following, and I, I remember it as if it was yesterday, so I will quote it. He said, we send satellites into orbit for 29 years on tight profit margins, but you lawyers can't put a number on anything. So, last comment as to sort of the genesis of how I ended up here. And I do have to make a disclosure that David Wilkins and I went to the high, high school together at the lab school at the University of Chicago. I'm a couple of years older. But that's not, the, the genesis was really that I, eight or nine years ago, spoke to Elena Kagan when she was still here. And I said, Elena, you know, this is a fantastic law school, but you're sending people off to run law firms, to run legal departments of corporations. In some cases, you have examples from Citi, from Pfizer. Recently, the acting, uh, general, the acting CEO of United comes from the legal ranks, who run entire corporations. Yet you're not really training or teaching anyone to learn how to husband resources and spend money as if it were your own. And I think this center is making a big step in that direction. But to me, that was a key subject. And that discussion evolved into a further talk with David and others from the center here. And here I am. So the topic, managing outside counsel and the role of in-house lawyers. So let me start. Let's focus first on outside counsel. And let me say, you know, no big surprise here, but my own personal view is that lawyers outside need to be more proactive, creative. Uh, they need to, uh, using a, a famous book that hopefully all of you read and are still reading, because it's still on the bestseller list of the New York Times for business books, Roger Fisher May Rest in Pieces, Getting to Yes. Wonderful book. Uh, if you haven't read it, I commend it to you. Uh, so... First thing I would note is scorched earth tactics. This is a big issue I see with our general counsel, and it, it still is true. People often leave wonderful law firms like this, and they go to corporations, and, or excuse me, to law firms, and they have a monolithic approach. In some firms, they, they sort of train you this way, but not all by any stretch, where it, the monolithic approach involves sort of leaving no stone unturned. And that can work, but in our more cost-sensitive age, there's a need to, as Michelle said, do more with less, as we'll get into that in a couple of moments. So, uh, you know, a big issue is with scorched earth, is this what the client really wants to achieve? Do we need to send battalions at issues? Increasingly today, I see general counsel who cherry pick uh, a partner or two from a particular law firm as well as others from other firms, and he, he or she doesn't want 22 other associates, a partridge and a pear tree, and hire all these other people. You can create virtual law firms. So a big issue is you cannot have, whether it's in litigation and other areas, a monolithic approach to how you do things. A concept that goes in tandem with that is, do you always need to design what I call a Rolls-Royce engine? Perhaps it's not politically correct to suggest today Volkswagen, but perhaps a Chevy or, or some other vehicle. The, the point is, is that what I see with our general counsel is increasingly they will either go to non-top-tier firms for non-bet-the-company cases, and we can talk about bet-the-company cases, which I think are exceptions. Um, and these are, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but these are wonderful firms with leaner, meaner teams who can do the work and who have a different approach and who don't throw necessarily bodies with a lack of continuity to issues and don't necessarily have uh, folks who wear all T-shirts that uh, uh, have inner office team meetings on a weekly basis that clients, frankly, disdain. Doing more with less. It was already adverted to. You know, it works both ways. Um, you can increasingly do more with less resources if you understand what those resources are and utilize them wisely. The problem, and it's evolving, and I think it's improved, uh, but the problem is, is that many uh, 
uh, lawyers until recently were uh, not only resentful of uh, in outside firms of doing budgets, but they were not good at doing it. It was essentially, well, I guess we'll go through the exercise, but we'll come up with a number, multiply it by two or three, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. And uh, eventually it's involved, so it has gotten better. But unless you have a good sense of what you your cost structure is and how a law firm operates this way. And increasingly, law firms have brought in folks who are non-lawyers who are focused on the bottom line of the law firm and profitability. But the fact is, is uh, and a good example is, and this was a public uh, uh, article, so I, it was about December, maybe five or six years ago, Paul Beach, who is was an, until recently, he's retiring at the end of this year. He's now the head of compliance, but he was the uh, head of litigation at United Technologies, a client of ours. And he did a beauty contest, as he writes about in the article, and he asked a series of firms, uh, I think it was in the labor employment area, give me a fixed price for how you're going to do the work. And two firms came up with the same number, and one uh, he asked, explain to me how you arrived at this number, and they explained quite clearly how many people they had and how many depositions they were going to take and what resources they were going to expend. It made sense. The other said, well, I'm not sure how we got there, but we'll stick to it at least for the first six months or a year. Well, that's a recipe for disaster, but it's also more indicative, in my view, of what's out there. Unless you have a good handle on cost structure and, as I say, husbanding more an agricultural term, resources, it's difficult to assess it. I think, as we talked in a preliminary session um, with Nathan and uh, with Michelle, that it's been a buyer's market for law department, general counsel, heads of litigation, law department administrators. Increasingly, you have procurement teams involved in finance. They just didn't know it. And now I think with the recession, even if we're coming out of it or otherwise the Great Recession, the fact is, is that they have a lot of leverage and they need to, to utilize it. But from the outside counsel standpoint, they need to sort of wean themselves from doing more, throwing more bodies, expending more time on motions uh, and, and steps that may not make sense isn't necessarily what the client wants. And that really uh, goes to the next point which is the word no. I like to say, and I've written about this, that many law firms sadly don't have the word no in their lexicon. Um, it's difficult if you're a, a lawyer in a law firm to say no to a client that you can't do something. It's not that you can't do it, you can. The question is, is it logical? Does it make sense? Is it efficient for you to do so? You know, many of you are too young, although they have reruns of uh, Miracle on 34th Street. Are you familiar with that movie? Well, you know, it's a holiday movie, but the concept in it is that someone, I, I don't remember, I always mix it up, someone from Macy's sent someone to Gimbel's or vice versa. Well, the idea, and I'm not going to name law firms, that a law firm is going to say, well, we could do this for you, but we're like a, a really large, big law firm, and for us to do that is really not efficient for you with the bodies that we would have to throw at it, and so we really think you ought to go to a boutique firm or a firm that has a different approach as to how they handle it, that would be a breath of fresh air. But you don't frequently see that. Uh, so to me, a bugaboo is that it's rare to see a law firm you know, decline something on the ground that I don't think we can do it in a way that's cost effective for you. And let me digress because I know one of the august fellows of this center, uh, Ben Heineman, uh, you know, uh, his newest uh, uh, successor is a guy named Alex Dimitriev, who uh, went to this fine law school. And I do know Alex, and I remember when we analyzed some work for Alex and for uh, GE, he, he looked at this and he saw all the people we analyzed on this matter. He said, well, I would have never done this, because mind you, he was in-house, or excuse me, before he was in-house, he was at Kirkland, a great firm. And he looked at it and he said, well, if there were all these associates on this, I would have taken them off because they put in insignificant or de minimis amounts of time. Well, that's the right approach, but it's not always the case in terms of how 
you know, uh, law firms handle things and how they need to sort of explore beyond. So that takes us sort of to the issue of being creative and uh, getting to yes. What do I mean by yes? Like Roger Fisher did, you really need to analyze with the client, the corporation, whoever you're representing, what is the end game? Is it really that we simply are a defendant and we want to protract something or not resolve it in litigation? Uh, what do we want to do in other contexts to sort of solve the client's problem? But there has to be a greater attentiveness of looking at, and I think the word collaboration comes to mind. I actually read on the plane coming here, the Harvard Law Bullet, and I haven't read it for years, it was my classmate, uh, John Roberts. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts was on the cover, um, and in it, in the article on the Center for the Legal Profession, uh, it talks about the need for collaboration. So I think there has to be an effort more to find new and better ways of doing things and uh, thinking outside the box. Uh, too frequently, I think lawyers take the mindset We've always done it this way, it works well, why do we need to change it? And if the economy changes, it's simply a cyclical process and we'll come out of it and uh, at least some of the firms, I think, have the swagger and belief that they don't need to change. And, and I think that's the mistake. But I also think before we move to the other side of the equation, in-house lawyers, that you hire, and this may be a hackneyed phrase, you hire individuals, you don't hire firms. So there's a great variance within a law firm necessarily of how a given partner, he or she may handle a particular matter, and that's something you need to look at. And as an in-house counsel segueing over, I think you really need to uh, be proactive in that regard. So let's touch on in-house lawyers and the issue of proactivity. And uh, time doesn't permit me to tell many anecdotes, but I'm going to at least tell one because I know lots of folks who I think are at the cutting edge as general counsel. Uh, the one I'm going to focus on for the moment is a guy named Jim Seifert. Jim was, and I worked with him when he was at Toro, he was the head of litigation at Toro uh, in the Twin Cities, uh, and he was now the general counsel of Echolab, uh, a, a very large uh, uh, international uh, hygiene and cleaning uh, corporation. Um, why do I mention Jim? Jim essentially took the docket of tort docket of Toro with uh, accidents with snowblowers and other products they had and essentially put himself out of business. He was successful in uh, preventing these types of matters by taking an active role with the folks who market the products and not only with the warnings but how things are developed and if a matter happened he would view the clients and folks to come in before they ever brought a lawsuit. He essentially, essentially eliminated the docket. That is an example of steps that could be taken. Another example I can think of a company that I, I don't, doesn't exist anymore. I, I, I clerked for a judge who had the uh, AT&T versus MCI case. Do any of you remember MCI? Well, MCI Telecommunications at one time got a $1.8 billion verdict uh, in Chicago. But one of the people I worked with at MCI uh, took their patent portfolio and he said, these are the crown jewels of the company and I'm going to turn it into a profit center. So he took steps that essentially had the law department as an independent profit center within a company. You know, these types of steps are unusual, uh, but I think they are the wave of the future, even though that was done years ago. But I could give many other examples if there are questions or comments. Again, a hackneyed phrase, you can't control what you don't measure. And until recently, most corporations did not examine, you can look at a little quality. You know, the, 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 the three legs of a chair of legal work is generally quality, responsiveness, and last, and it should be last, is cost. But you can compare law firm performance. I say you don't hire individuals, you hire firms. We specialize in that, and we've at any one time analyzed maybe five, six hundred million dollars of invoices. So we have a very good idea, and we sit on unparalleled databases. You need to look at how do law firms compare to each other? How do partners within a firm compare to partners in other firms in terms of the kinds of teams they set up? When I say 
the factors you look at, it includes everything from how many personnel are used, at what level, what's the critical mass, you know, to what degree are people putting in, as Alex said, insignificant or de minimis amounts of time, uh, to what extent uh, are you paying in the old world, as it was called, for overhead clerical services, uh, ministerial work, uh, like, you know, doing an abstract of uh, uh, deposition or, uh, you know, a summary of uh, some interview, which you want to do, but we want to pay for it for market rates. Database work where you may have stuff done technologically in a more sophisticated way, but you still have to have at some law firms the work done manually as well. Looking at issues like inter-office conferencing. You know, genius can emerge walking down the hall, talking to another partner or calling on the phone someone in another office. But the question is, how much do clients need to subsidize and underwrite this? You know, there, I could continue with the factors, but when you begin to look at this, you can also see instances where some firms are more efficient than others. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a bad news situation. Marsh Smith, who I had the pl privilege of working with at 3M, the general counsel, uh, often said, including in public settings, so I'm not speaking out of school, he also was a general counsel of ADM. You know, uh, you know, he said, you know, you can find good news in these where when he used our analysis, he found that a firm was particularly efficient, so you ought to use them more rather than less. And so, you know, the bottom line with all of this is you do need to measure more. I think the article on the center and the law bulletin, which I refer to only because I happened to read it recently, talks about the need to evaluate quality more. And I think that there is a hunger for data. And frankly, the American lawyer and others now have to a third decimal place the profitability of law firms. But you need to look at a host of other factors. And it, it, nothing ought to be reduced to a single number, but you need to look at how personnel are used, how resources are amassed and, and, and uh, tapped, and all of that really does matter. Which goes to the whole issue that costs now, unlike maybe 15 years ago or otherwise, where some people felt it didn't matter, they do. You know, last year we saved companies over $5 billion. Uh, you know, my wife at one point when I started the company said, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's not. But the fact is, is there's a lot that can be done to reduce costs. And part of it also, and I'm going to segue into this, is looking at how legal work is done. I'm talking in terms of fee structures, as well as work that need not be done by law firms, which traditionally and frequently are. In terms of first aligning interests and alternative fees, let me touch on that for a minute. And someone quoted me uh, a week ago or two weeks ago. I spoke at a conference actually in Chicago. And it's interesting because you now have CFOs and procurement folks who are getting more involved in the legal sphere. That can be a good thing, but it's not widgets. All of you know that uh, legal services are not like procuring pencils or any other uh, commoditized product as such. But there really is a need to evaluate you know, how, how, how this work is done. Uh, and with regard to aligning interests, uh, the way that billable work is done on a pure hourly rate is great for law firms. It's heads we win, tails you lose. And it, it doesn't make sense. The problem is, and I was being quoted, and now I remember my train of thought, sorry. Um, the gentleman quoted me in a comment that I wrote some years ago, which is slightly embarrassing, but I'll say it anyway. He said, I believe you said this, that alternative fees are like teenage sex. People talk about it a lot more than they do it, and those who do it don't necessarily know what they're doing. <laughs> I did say that. I think today teenagers are probably more sophisticated. Uh, having said that, I guess if you were to ask me, have we morphed or evolved much in terms of alternative fees, I would say to a limited degree. I think more people continue to talk about it, but many, and it goes back to what I said earlier, whether it's budgeting or doing early case assessments, and the, the, frankly from the inside counsel's role, the big stumbling block that I often see, although we work with so many companies, is 
people want to think great thoughts. They want to be at the cutting edge. The dirty, moneyed side of the building business of costs matter is something that's disdained. So it's something that is not frequently a subject of desire. So are there more alternative fee arrangements than what I'm referring to here? And you know, it's widely written. Some law firms have whole departments that focus on them. The idea is that the work ought to be done on a cap basis or in phases and where you know going in what you're going to actually expend within some reasonable limits. And so under an hourly rate, what you don't make up for in the hour, you make up for in, 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 in the rate, you, don't, you make up for in the number of hours. So at the end of the day, it can constantly be out of kilter and you could be on a budget and three quarters of the way through it and you only went through month one. We've designed a lot of those programs, and I think it's incumbent on corporations and law firms with better collaboration, and we urge regular meetings between the law firms and the companies in designing these programs and having play in the joints, since the law firms still need to make a profit, and no one's suggesting they shouldn't. But more needs to be done in this regard. But my fear is that people still revert, and there are a lot of folks who are just reluctant to do it at all and don't see. And then there are some areas that lend themselves more, employment, labor, I think some environmental work. Uh, but I've seen it also done very successfully in litigation where you have, you look at what the likely outcome is and you set stretch goals uh, to incent folks so you're aligned. The interest of the law firm is aligned so it's not simply that it's in the best interest of the law firm, albeit short-sighted, to uh, you know, take a matter to the courthouse steps and applying our scorched earth tactics to uh, you know, bludgeon the other side. It may not be something, in some instances, no question, the corporation may seek that. But in other instances, it's quite possible it's not desired by the client either. Lastly, let me touch on unbundling that was adverted to in um, Michelle's opening. And, uh, my own view on that, and unbundling means different things to different people, so let me qualify it. You know, my own view, and I've been saying this maybe for 15 or 20 years, is that law firms will always have a role to play, but they need not do all things for all people. So whether it's aspects of due diligence, it's aspects of certainly e-discovery with the advent of technology, and I can refer to that a little more because I think it's instructive. There are many things that law firms do that need not, need not be done by them. There are wonderful firms today who could supplant the role of, and this dates me, but back in the 1970s and even in the 80s, there was things like the IBM antitrust case. There were people who spent their entire career in a law firm working on the discovery aspects of that case. And they didn't, frankly, learn a lot more. That's not to say it wasn't an important role, but a lot of that work could be supplanted today. Are many firms doing it? Some. You know, are some firms like Morgan Lewis and others have their own e-discovery practice, but there are also ways that are not just, you know, offshoring it to India or the Philippines, but using linguistics experts, for example, and I learned of one of these firms, and I'll mention it, because I've recommended it to a lot of clients and they're really cutting edge. And Arthur Miller, again, who I still am in touch with at NYU now, at Harvard, um, recommended them. It's a firm called H5. H5 uh, brings in people who can find through linguistics and robust computer search engines, needles in haystacks. And you don't have to go by my assessment. The United States Department of Commerce actually did a study a few years ago from their National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And they evaluated law firms. They evaluated outsourcing entities in, uh, overseas that I adverted to, like in, in Asia and elsewhere. And firms like H5, and there was a vast difference in, you know, everyone found what were the relevant documents, but the issue was to what degree did you populate the field of the appropriate pool of necessary documents with a lot of, without a lot of false positives. And technology can eclipse what law firms do in this regard. It's another example of something that 
need not be done by law firms and that ought to be done without run, running into like the M word because law firms will often say, well, I have to, we have to control everything. If we do that, we'll otherwise run into malpractice or you know, we, we aren't comfortable, the M word. But the fact is that's not necessary. Let me, let me stop there and take, take some questions. I'll just make a parting comment. I, I think that what you're going to see in the future, you know, everyone can be a prognosticator, and I certainly don't have any 2020 hindsight. I think you're going you're to continue to see large law firms who uh, are trying to bulk up in size. I think some will be successful at that. Honestly, I think organic growth is better uh, in that, but I also think you're going to cre- have more savvy general counsel who realize that they have more leverage create virtual law firms, not only where they use the axioms, firms I'm sure you're familiar with, where people who change their lifestyle work for firms that are temporary staffing firms and they can work from their comfort of their own home while they raise children or otherwise, but they can do meaningful and appropriate work. But you're going to have general counsel who are going to say, we're going to hire one or two individuals who are experts and partners in this field and one or two from here and we don't want your other cadres and we're going to ask you to check your egos at the door and set up new ways for how work is done. And some of it's going to involve more cooperative processes, and some I think will involve, uh, and I've only begun to read about it, uh, you know, uh, law, law without walls, uh, you know, the kind of work that Michelle and her people are doing. So let me stop there and uh, take some questions. Yes? Thank you for your comments. I have, a, I have a concern about your presentation because what's missing for me, when you're advising, I want to go to your Alex Dimitri. So Alex could look at a firm's services and see how they've deployed their staff and associates. But having grown up in a traditional firm, shouldn't we care about not only how they're using young associates and who the young associates are, the demographics of the partners and the associates in those matters? If we if we look at this from a purely clinical metrics merit quality uh, reality, we're going to eventually weed out from our law firms and from our sort of uh, professional services some of the more important things that we, we as a society should care about. People, I mean, I think we, we look at law firms, we have women, we have minorities, we have people with disabilities in our firms, and if we're only gonna go in and counsel them to get the most efficient, cost-effective, bottom line result, I, I shudder to think what kind of society we're gonna look like. Well, I, 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 I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I'm not counseling for that. I, I think you know, many of the corporations we work with have outstanding minority and diversity programs. And what we're talking about here is not some clinical, sanitary you know, uh, sharpening of pencils where quality and, and, and responsiveness are put to the side. It's rather that it's fine to have quality people who come in with diversity or women or others who work cases. They just ought not to be involved for two or three hours and substitute out of the matter. You ought to have dedicated teams of people. So what we're talking about here is really, uh, you know, an approach which focuses on, I think, all issues, but also looks at how personnel are used with continuity. So, you know, I, I appreciate the societal point, but I don't think it can be, it necessarily is diminished. And I've seen great examples where firms who've won awards for, you know, uh, their hiring and diversity, you know, turn in the most efficient, you know, analyses that we do. And it's simply how they use the people and how they train them. And I also think how you train individuals in law firms. Today, many law firms don't want to spend the money to do it. There's some. Who, who do, and to their credit, I think are rewarded for it because I think if they train people better, uh, they will become better lawyers. And some of that shouldn't rest at the, on the nickel or be subsidized by the corporation. Yes? Um, one of the things, last June, the, the Association of General of the ACC uh, sponsored a conference for new section. growing function and function which they have been is an important aspect towards improving the ability of, of, of legal departments to think about the kinds of questions, some of which are the same kinds of questions that 
few from you. And I wonder to what extent have you seen that the, the elaboration of a specialist function there, which is kind of partly management function, partly legal function, has changed the way in which uh, companies are analyzing these kinds of problems and the kinds of solutions that they're interested in, in undertaking? I think it's a good question. Um, first, the ACC has been a pioneer in the whole value challenge, so I'll just touch on that before answering more directly. That goes also to the whole issue of alternative fees and what is the value that is created by the work that's done? Because at the end of the day, you have to be able to assess what result did you achieve and what was done. I do think having folks look at these issues more, but not with a visor, uh, uh, you know, where numbers only are, are looked at, you're looking at a host of different factors, I think has led to increased scrutiny of uh, not only the results, but how the work ought to be done. I think increasingly certain types of matters, certain firms have recognized ought to be handled in, with different types of teams. And I think that's in part occurred because they've brought in folks who've looked at it sort of with uh, lens not of a lawyer but of a business person and that could be procurement it could be finance and I think that has been a positive development through the ACC yes so I agree with um, Derek and his point about people and how people matter and I also agree with you and your point about training and if you put those two together for me they mean that we need to be focusing on a lot of the people in this room and that our talent and our future, uh, be creative, getting to yes, thinking outside the box, uh, innovative, whatever word you want to use it, mm -hmm. um, is going to be driven by and come from um, our younger lawyers and the lawyers that are entering the marketplace today that think differently about um, how to approach service, how to provide advice, where, uh, through what mediums. So I think if we put it together, if that's true, um, A, what do you think the future holds for us in terms of our future talent innovation and training? And B, can you think of any instances now or recently, you, you know, you've seen so much. If on the right hand side, we, you gave us tons of examples of innovations by general counsels. General counsels used to be the law firm partners. So what are the innovations that over here on this side that have occurred? There are some, like right? so for example, Alan Novery and their Belfast LPO or Goodwin. I mean, tiny noticeable things. What, can you give us a few examples? Maybe start with two and then lead to one, which is your vision for the future. Okay, let me first speak to the issue uh, you know, of the young and the folks in this room because honestly I think you know, innovation comes from those who start with a blank sheet and who are willing to question almost everything. And honestly I think that a lot of folks who leave the Harvards of the world need not necessarily go into a law firm. I think there are many other outlets, so I want to touch on that for a moment. Plus, I think increasingly some of the pharmas and others have designed programs where you go in-house at an earlier stage, and I think that's something that ought to be explored too. In terms of creativity on the law firm side, uh, I have, uh, you know, a few I probably w won't mention the law firm by name, uh, only because of the sensitivity of it, but I can see, uh, you know, Eversheds, for example, from the UK have, uh, you know, done some, I think, very uh, clever, forward-thinking approaches for how they bundle certain types of work together and underwrite certain expenses. I think in some areas when we design requests for proposal and bids, a law firm who purports to be National Coordinating Council has said, Number one, if we're national, then we ought not to charge for any travel. In fact, uh, you know, they uh, will underwrite all of that expense themselves. They have taken steps in companies to uh, provide a lot of prophylactic or preventive law training to the business unit heads and others, or compliance work, and, and viewed that as part of the cost of doing business, uh, or, you know, been aggressive in writing off work. My only problem with the writing off of work by companies, by law firms, is you often get a letter, Dear Michelle, you can't imagine how much we've written off. And the answer is that's exactly right, because they don't typically tell you, and you don't know if Associate X and Y, who they keep consistently writing off, is still on the file or not. 
uh, you know, I've given you more than a few examples, but does that begin to speak to your? I think law firms right now today and law firm partners struggle with what do you mean by uh, be creative or innovate or think outside the box other than pushing on fees and how you bundle matters. Well, let, let me speak to that for a second. So, for example, we've designed for maybe 300 publicly traded companies their so-called rules of the road or guidelines for outside counsel. One thing we put in there all the time is that you ought to have a presumption of an alternative fee arrangement. Not because the corporation has to accept it, but you, the law firm, ought to wax creative and come up with different approaches that the client ought to consider. There are firms who do that. You know, a spin-off of Kirkland, the Bartlett Beck firm, you know, they're at a point now in their evolution of their practice that, you know, first they use firms like the H5s of the world for technology, and they really try cases. And so they, when they cherry, they, they pick a matter, they know what they're going to do with it, they're able to more aggressively focus on how the work is done, and they use far smaller teams. And the people can be, uh, uh, you know, of diversity and otherwise, and they are well rewarded. I'm just, I was suggesting simply that they shouldn't be coming in and out constantly, but we shouldn't look at it as some, you know, surgical, uh, you know, uh, approach where we bludgeon the, the, the process. But I think other steps can be taken. Other comments, questions? Yes, in the back. So I got three questions. The first two is just, so I have a, a okay. for me. Should I write it down here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So really good questions. And then yeah, the yeah. Third one, And then this is the third one where I, I think uh, you need your commentary on how are these um, legal departments thinking about litigation financing as a way to cost cut? Okay, uh, let me start at the top. You know, it's very hard to generalize. We get involved, especially in litigation, but also otherwise in the largest matters that you would read about in the newspapers and otherwise. So. The typical companies we look at, and I, I can't say that's in the average, but are corporations who spend, and I'm talking exclusively outside at this point, 15, 20 million a year or more. And you know, it goes up to over a billion. There are companies in this, publicly traded companies that, that expand that. As to the issue of plaintiffs, you, you, your question was directed from the law firm side. To, to what degree do law, or from the corporation side to plaintiff suits? Uh, the, the corporation. Okay. Um, I think that's increasing. Um, and, you know, because I think they sometimes see that we need to be more aggressive in the IP area, intellectual property, otherwise in uh, being uh, zealous about what we own and otherwise. But... Um, in, there has been, and uh, maybe this is underlying your question, a uh, view in the past that um, uh, we don't want to be in court and we simply want to get out of matters and we'll protect our rights. But I think there's an increased focus on doing that. I think some companies are training people more in-house to do some of that work themselves because of the institutional knowledge they have rather than necessarily outsourcing it to one or a series of law firms. So I think it's a trend that's increasing, but I think it's still at a relatively early stage. You know, as to the issue of financing, and that's from the corporate side too, you're asking? Um, I th well, you know, first, remember, these are people who, well, let me answer it three ways. These are people who often, until recently, said, I got to go to a board, and you used which law firm in which city? So they're gun-shy and radioactive to begin with. Second, 
Um, these are the same people who were reluctant or reticent about doing alternative fee arrangements where less is at stake. Does it make sense as a possibility? Yes. My view is it's done very little. I think there's fear of conflicts or otherwise, or simply that they don't want to be the first to wade into these waters. I'm not saying it's not done, and frankly, I think more of it's being done across the pond in the UK and otherwise. Uh, but it can be fraught with difficulties, and you have ever more aggressive satellite litigation spawned over disqualification and other problems. And uh, I think from the corporate side, it is a way to address it, but I think the CFOs and procurement folks would rather keep their knitting under the tent, uh, even if it's an idea that ought to be considered. Other comments? Yes. I'm absolutely a buyer of the law firm seeks for change the way they do things when you don't have great analytics. I used to work at Goldman and the idea of like getting paid by the hour is just like so fundamentally different than how a lot of industries operate. Um, but one thing that makes me a little bit nervous is this focus on efficiency. Um, and I'm wondering whether efficiency is sort of a good overarching sort of way of looking at metrics-based analysis for law firms. Because on the one hand, there's efficiency, but on the other hand, there's creativity and you know, I think that people think about efficiency and they think about sort of cost reduction. Um, but there are a lot of reasons for law firms to kind of try new things and do things differently and think out of the box like you were talking about. And I think the other half of cost reduction is like value addition. Um, and I, I'm just nervous that some of the ways that I've heard people talking about this is this focus on kind of reducing. Well, I think the answer, let me let you finish. I think there's a good answer to no, that. No, I was just curious. So yeah, yeah. Well, I think, the, I think it goes directly to the point dealing with aligning interests and alternative fee structures because, you know, you can set up arrangements which are highly creative um, and where you reward outstanding results or resolving something at an earlier stage, getting out of a regular ma regulatory matter in the EU or otherwise, and I think you, the corporation, ought to reward that. When we do our analyses, we don't, by any stretch, ignore quality or responsiveness issues or the outcomes. We're simply affording them more data because they, frankly, have never kept that. And it helps to compare how given matters of like kind are handled and what the cost is to taking a matter up to a certain phase or stage. But I'm a big believer that more and more work ought to be done on, 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 in a way that rewards creativity. You know, when I spoke a few years ago as a keynote for the GC100, the chief legal officers of the FTSE 100 companies, you know, I, I got a shocked question from a GC because it was in the middle of the recession, it was 2009 or something, and he said, are you suggesting that we ought to pay premiums to lawyers for outstanding results and I said I, I know that sounds perhaps remarkable to you but if you know the shoe fits yeah I guess I do uh, you know I think there's also truth that sometimes you have to have skin in the game where if the result goes south that you know you may end up getting less but I, I think creativity ought to be rewarded the big problem if you want to get into it with law firms is the interest of the individual lawyer or the associate going up to get the brass ring as partner may not coincide necessarily with the best interest of the co company and the corporation. You touched on it a moment ago, Michelle, because the fact is, is uh, uh, what is in the interest of the corporation uh, may not always be the same as, uh, as, as the law firm. But I lost my train of thought now. Um, with the creativity issue, I honestly think that there's a lot more that could be done to design it so that you reward people and you give them the opportunity to, to shine and try new approaches. And if the new, oh, what I was gonna say is, often resolving something at a very early stage of a matter of any type will make you a huge hero with the client. But it doesn't generate a lot of fees. So in some law firms, that's a problem because they said, you know, you could have taken this to the you know, courthouse steps, but you endear yourself with a client. So I think approaches like that warrant not only 
special dispensation, but increased fees and premiums in any age. Yes, Michelle. Well, you, we talked a little bit about metrics, and you made a great point about value. So how does a general counsel evaluate value-add or innovative, innovative or you know, whatever, all, whatever word you want to use, it doesn't make everybody uncomfortable. Um, and are you pushing these general counsels afterwards to evaluate their, their law firms? And is one of the key criteria uh, the value add or the creativity? Do they get extra points or extra money? And what, what would even that look like? I mean, is it like efficiency, quality, responsiveness, and innovativeness? I mean, what? Although I think, that, I think the key to doing all this is, and I maybe only touched on it in passing earlier, is when you have a matter of any type at the beginning, the first thing you ought to do is you ought to break it down and both on the in-house counsel side and on the outside counsel side, first separately and then together. You ought to figure out what are we trying to do here? And the corporation has to elucidate that issue so you decide what is our end game, what do we want to achieve, and then we ought to talk about what the law firm ought to do, or law firms, as in big matters, you're going to have multiple firms involved. And if you do that right, you can design it so that you can put, you know, the fee will be 80% based on hourly rates, and you'll put some money in reserve. And then it's assessed later, either in a joint fashion or more typically subjectively, but with certain metrics by the folks in the corporation. And is one of those metrics ever being creative? Creativity is part of it, but it wouldn't be, the word creative wouldn't be there. We would talk about specific goals that would say that, you know, you resolved this summary judgment earlier, you took a step that eliminated this party, you know, specific concrete steps, but to get there you had to apply creative different approaches. So I think you can design fee arrangements increasingly that reward parties for doing this. The gentleman's question at the top obviously was from the corporate side, but too you know, few law firms are willing to take risk of taking on plaintiff's matters, and some can be extremely rewarding and remunerative. Uh, and the issue is uh, their willingness to do so. But to the, the lady's question, I think that creativity is an important element if it's designed right at an early point you can factor that in as part of how the matter is ultimately assessed and on a fee side too. Other comments as our time wanes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you touched upon this in, in different ways, but I, I'd love to ha have you uh, take it head on, which is this issue about training. And if you think this model is kind of putting uh, pressure on traditional training models at law firms, which I think you are saying, um, and then second, what do you do about that? And you've, you've kind of referenced in a few places you need other ways to train lawyers. And this is, again, is at the same time when, as we know, lawyers are having more and more kind of diverse careers. They're going from one firm to another firm. And these things seem to be kind of... Pulling uh, at each other. Yeah, competing with each other. Because if, if firms are going to invest out of their own pocket in training personnel, and but personnel are leaving faster and faster, I mean, some people have looked at this and kind of see this as a potential crisis. I don't know if you share that view and, or would go that far or read it in a different way. And then what do you do about it, however you read the problem? Right. It, it's a vexing problem. I'm not sure I would put it at the stage that it's uh, a crisis. Um, but I, you know, without naming names, there are a lot of firms today who are leery and uh, reluctant to train extensively young lawyers because of the continuity concern that they have. Forget about the law, the corporation side where you want continuity, but people may leave so they don't want to invest a lot and they don't believe that corporations will underwrite that. You know, I, you know, in our company, although by no means do we, uh, you know, serve as the only voice in this wilderness, have argued for years, it's against my own interest because my son is at one of the law firms who's been mentioned already today. Um, he is a second year. I'm a big believer that from the corporate side, you shouldn't be paying for 
first or second year associates unless they bring special value. Now that's not to say they shouldn't be put on the matter, but it says that the corporation you know, has something to say about that, but the law firm should invest their own money. It, it's a wise move and it improves, I think, the training of the people. I think it also may lead some to stay, but many of them view it as more a dollars and cents issue and they're not willing to do it, which leads to other approaches such as that, you know, there never used to be, but Pfizer and a few others, I think GE is doing it now and a, a number, you know, for really qualified people, they're going to bring them in earlier. They're going to train them their, themselves. And now, is that a desirable model and approach if you don't want to go into teaching or pro bono or legal aid or some other? It, 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 it Different strokes for different folks. You know, honestly, you know, if you can, whatever training you get, you know, one of the best training if you're going to do litigation is to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office. But today that's pretty difficult. And often people I learn are only clerking, not out of school, but years later after they've already been in a firm or otherwise. So I think the whole issue of training is an important one. And what's in the best interest of the young lawyer may not be coinciding with the best interests of the entity they work for. And that's a problem. Other comments, reactions? Yes. Um, what kind of technology have you seen in the market that supports the general counsel function? And you know, what is the technology piece that has you, you've seen that has uh, improved the efficiency or quality or just peace of mind of the general counsel? Well, it's a multifold. I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's a product out there. The gentleman mentioned the ACC Value Challenge. There's a product called Align, A-L-I-G-N, uh, which is essentially legal decision making on value proposition on steroids. And it allows a general counsel for complete visibility of everyone working on all these different matters and how they're doing it, but looking at all the factors across societal interests as well as quality control. Uh, so I think that is something that uh, uh, is increasingly uh, uh, done, but you know it, it's I think fewer and further between still. It's, it's not done on a consistent basis. You know, I think that's one step. I think there, uh, the whole area of e-discovery and what can be done of outsourcing that. You don't need to have cadres of associates with or without visors looking at documents when for the first and second and maybe even third level review before you look at privilege and core documents it could be done instead of with people with post-it notes who speak English in the Philippines or India, just to give two examples, but where machines do this far more complexly, much faster, and uh, considerably cheaper. And I think that has helped. Um, those are two examples. Well, I think we're about out of time. Um, thank you so much, Rick, for sharing you. your wealth of experience with working with general counsels and your thoughts on outside counsel and uh, the changes that have happened and that are about to happen. It's, uh, it's definitely great to be a part of this changing landscape, and we were so fortunate to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.